David Ruggles, one of the uh, true heroes of the Underground Railroad, who we hear uh, so little about here. But um, Ruggles, in a seven-year period, uh, estimated that he had helped to save 600 people from slavery, a pretty remarkable number. Um, and um, but operating out of New York. So there was a very strong black community here in Norwich, uh, very much involved with the issues of civil rights, uh, the abolition of slavery uh, in the South, and so forth. Uh, Connecticut, I, I am ashamed to say, oh, okay. Connecticut in 1818 had passed a new constitution uh, where the right to vote was vested in white males. If you were not a white male in Connecticut, 21 years of age or older, you could not vote. Um, some states allowed that. Um, Vermont, Massachusetts, New York had limited suffrage for black voters, but Connecticut, if you were black, you could not vote, uh, and if you were female. Um, so Connecticut was sometimes referred to as the Georgia of the North. Uh, it had a very poor track record for things like uh, civil rights um, and so on. It's probably no accident when the Amistad was captured in Long Island Sound that she was brought into a Connecticut court rather than uh, New York. Um, 1837, the good citizens of Norwich passed an ordinance which said that no town property, like the city hall, could be used for any abolitionist or by any abolitionist speaker. Um, but just to show you how things change, seven years later, Henry B. Stanton, husband of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, spoke here on abolition. Uh, he was given the use of the city hall, but he was stoned. He threw stones through the windows of the city hall, had to stop the proceedings, nail up two inch thick oak boards on the windows and then let him continue. And yet in 1856, Stanton says he was welcomed here. You know, and, and certainly by the 1860s, things had, uh, late 1850s, 1860s, things had changed pretty radically, mainly due, I think, to things like the Dred Scott decision, the, uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act that um, created a battleground out of Kansas where people were dying. Um, the um, uh, Fugitive Slave Act, which said that uh, anyone could be deputized to catch a fugitive slave, um, and that if you refused to assist in the capture, you would be subject to fines and imprisonment. Well, that did not sit well with the northern public and probably drove more people into um, opposing slavery and the efforts of slaveholders to get their uh, their property, as it were, uh, back. So when Lincoln came here in 1860, the country was already a a, um, a, a powder keg. Um, another reason is um, October, let's see, 16th, 17th. October of 1859, John Brown, a native of Connecticut, led 22 followers to Harper's Ferry, where he seized the federal arsenal in an effort to start a slave rebellion, which was certainly one of the things that helped to spark the Civil War. A young man from Norwich, Aaron Dwight Stevens, was one of John Brown's followers. Um, he was uh, sent out by Brown from the uh, engine house where Brown was holed up under a flag of truce, and the Virginia militia uh, riddled him with bullets. So young uh, Stevens, Aaron Dwight Stevens, um, was not executed immediately. They waited until he recovered. Because you see, by the weird logic of folks that believe in the death penalty, it isn't sporting to kill someone who's going to die anyways. So the state of Virginia nursed Stevens back to hell so they could <laughs> execute him on March 16, 1860. So when Lincoln arrives in Norwich on March 9, 1860, it's a very, very 
poignant thing. There's a local boy who's been condemned to death who's going to die in a week. It's only a week later that Aaron Dwight Stevens is the last one of Brown's Raiders at Harper's Ferry to die. <clears throat> you know, and the town hall is absolutely packed with people. Um, not just from Norwich, but they come from all over eastern Connecticut. The trains, um, special trains are put on to bring young men from places like Putnam and Danielson and uh, um, distant spots like that. And um, the hall was, uh, was crowded. Lincoln spoke for about two hours. Um, today we'd be bored to death, but remember there was no TV. This was a form of entertainment and also you know, he was addressing a, a, a tremendous a national issue uh, threatening to pull the country apart. Um, so, <clears throat> anyway, he, he spoke here, then went back to the Warrican Hotel. We'll stop in there briefly on our little tour. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But, um, as I mentioned before, the courthouse burned down, I think, on April 12th. And Lincoln died on April 15, 1865. So there's actually a kind of a folk legend here in Norwich that that somehow the destruction of the courthouse and, and Lincoln's death were, were linked. That it was part of some vast conspiracy. Um, and that you know the courthouse and Lincoln had died at exactly the same time. Um, interesting how people think. <laughs> Conspiracy theories are, are uh, what? Did they know who burned it down? Actually, it probably was simply um, an accident. Oh. You know, uh, like a, a lantern left on or something and, and, you know, an accidental. There's no evidence, at least, of conspiracy. Of conspiracy. Okay. Uh-huh.